I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of Omni U Presents the H3O Art of Life show. The title of our show is Healing Arts Yoga. And I have someone in the studio who is very capable of having this discussion with me. This is Dr. Nadine Kelly. Hello. Hello. Namaste. Namaste. And the, the thing that the I'm going to read a lot of stuff, but I'm going to settle on the part on the thing that really got my attention. She's an experienced registered yoga teacher with 200 hours training. She's a children's yoga teacher. She's a yoga instructor, a health coach, a podcaster, a business owner, but she's a retired physician. Now that's why I put that last, because I cannot imagine how you came to that decision. So that's the first question I'm asking, is how you came to the decision to retire. In the first place, you're too young to be retired. <laughs> but, <laughs> but after we get over that part, how did you make that decision? That is quite a question. And it was a diff very difficult decision to make. But I had trained, so this is the way my training worked. I went to college at University of Chicago. Then that was followed by four years of medical school. I decided to go into pathology as my field. That was a five-year residency. And after that, I specialized in a subset of pathology called cytopathology. That was another year of training. After that, I practiced for seven years in a community setting. As I was a little bit of background. As I was going through schooling, I am the eldest of Haitian immigrants, firstborn generation here. And so family values and education values are very much instilled in my DNA. But I was also the oldest, firstborn here. And so really no one to necessarily guide me along the path, figuring things out as I went along. and. Based on my upbringing, my values, and the determination, my, also my personality, I really approached my medical training and becoming a physician with single-minded focus. I never really stopped to ask myself if this was necessarily a right fit. I was always looking through a lens of, I have to do this. I have to show and prove that I'm worthy of doing this. And so with that mindset, again, I never stopped to smell the roses and really decide, did this fit my mission in life, my purpose in life? And so over the years of actual practice after I trained, there came a point where I was feeling more and more dissatisfied. And I could no longer use the excuse of, as I had been doing all my life up until this point, when I know more, when I earn my space here, it'll be okay. It just became glaringly obvious that I was not happy and that my sense of purpose was not being nourished. So with a very, very heavy heart, very difficult decision because I felt like I was letting a lot of people down, my family, um, colleagues, I felt like I was letting myself down by deciding to stop. But I was also young, I was 40 when I decided to stop. And so it's not like I was near a finish line where I could say, well, if I just hold on for a little bit longer, everything will be okay. I didn't like the way the medical practice was becoming more business-like and how we were focusing on getting as many 
cases, as many patients through as possible. I wanted to be in the community. I was sitting behind a microscope a lot too. That was primarily what I did, with pathologist diagnosis diseases um, behind a microscope primarily. And being the type of person who wanted to be, feel like a part of the community, who wanted to see prevention and not just end results. The diagnosis a lot was, were things like cancer or a disorder, um, benign versus malignant, a problem. And while there's a lot of value in that, I just felt like it wasn't really the place I belonged. I craved to be in the more preventive atmosphere where I wanted to feel like I was helping a person face to face, touching another person, um, helping another person, um, enlightening another person, teaching another person, figure out ways to be healthy before getting to a doctor's office. All, all of that really combined with the fact that at the time I was practicing yoga myself. I did that because I needed to maintain my sanity while I was stressed out practicing medicine. And because my mother's a cancer survivor, we wound up, I introduced her to yoga as a healing modality to help her during her remission after cancer to stay healthy, um, to connect mind, body, and spirit. And so that's how I started yoga, and then I continued to nurture myself. I'm also a martial artist, and that was also another mind-body practice. So subconsciously, I was drawn to the mind-body connection anyway in my personal life, and it wasn't manifesting itself in my career. So that's when I decided to stop. I had no idea what I was going to do when I stopped absolutely no clue. And that's when I walked into a yoga studio in my community that night because I wanted to deepen my practice to figure out what was next on my road. I wanted quiet, I wanted clarity to figure out how could I best feel of service. I'm a person who believes in service and community and I didn't feel that that was being met again while I was practicing my medicine. It wasn't palatable to me. People said, well, why didn't you choose another field? It just wasn't palatable to me. I just described all the training I did. I was not going to go through another four, five, six year residency to go along another path. It just was no longer right. So I walked into the yoga studio. Halfway into the evening of yoga practice, I decided to go out and speak to someone about what I should do to practice more yoga for clarity. And they happened to have a teacher training program coming up. And so they said, why don't you try that? And I said, you've got to be kidding. A yoga, um, why would I train to become a yoga instructor? And so they said, well, you could use it in several ways. You don't have to necessarily teach. It's another way to learn more. So I thought, okay, let me take the plunge. And I did, halfway through the training, so this took about, the training was a long a period of about nine months or so. Halfway through, in walks a community yoga teacher by the name of Karen Nielsen. And she taught yoga in a way that made so much sense to me. Slow, focused, breath, detail, that a light bulb went off. And I said, oh, this is where I can tie in my medical knowledge, all those years that I put in to be this person, and combine that with service, teaching in my community, teaching people who don't think that they're capable of doing yoga, that it's a, uh, something stereotypical that can only be done by the youth. I, from the beginning, wanted to teach uh, a senior population, assisted living, uh, cancer survivors, that made more sense to me. I felt like I could really be in the realm of promoting and educating health, prevention, being in the present moment, being happy and satisfied with your body in whatever state it is. I have a different lens at the way I, I look at health because I practiced medicine for such a long time with not everything was a bad outcome, don't get me wrong, but I saw enough bad outcomes where I felt like life is such a precious thing and how can we really honor what we have?
So that's a very long-winded answer to no, your that question. Was not, I, was, I pre was prepared to sit here for as long as it took for you to get to whatever you thought you had wanted to say about that because I knew I was prying and that's not my job. My job. <laughs> <laughs> but I did think that I found it so interesting because I know so few people who have recognized that they are in the wrong place that what they are doing serves no purpose other than to uh, gain revenue or, you know, and that's an important thing uh, because, you know, we do live in a society based on money. And so if you don't have any, then living indoors and eating food and having transportation and other kinds of essential things uh, are at risk. And so it's very important, you know, that, that uh, people keep an eye on that while they make the decisions that they need to make. But it's a very courageous thing to do after, to say that uh, I have done enough of this. This is enough. In other words, um, I have committed myself fully to this. I have taken all the training. I have participated in the practice. And I have learned that there is another path for me to take. And I, I salute you for it. I really do appreciate you. And the, the, um, the, I want to quote two things. One is from the Buddha. He says, our body is precious. It is a vehicle for awakening, treat it with care. And I don't think most people think of themselves as being asleep as not mm -hmm. really knowing mm -hmm. who they are, mm -hmm. why they are, mm -hmm. what their purpose is. I think most people are given their purpose by other people. As you are growing up, somebody says, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up and you just choose something you've heard about, or they tell you you were born to be this or that, you know, or you would make a good this or that. I have a granddaughter right now who is struggling not to become an engineer, her father is one, because even though she has all the skills and all the, you know, the inclinations and, and all of that, that is, she wants to, she does not want to be, as she says, isolated in some cubicle designing things. You know, she wants, she wants to, she's a gregarious person, so she wants to be among people and so I can understand that, that, you know, you may have the aptitude to do all sorts of things, but then your choice is to try to align the things that you have the aptitude, aptitude to do with the thing that will do the most good for yourself and for others. Agreed. Yeah. I, I so agree. Well, you have chosen to do something that is very beneficial to other people because when I began to read about the benefits of yoga, which I had not understood because I understood yoga is a kind of Eastern way of life. It is not just, you know, a form of exercise. It is so much greater than that. And so I decided to look at the benefits and I saw, I had this, this long list. The benefits include sleep, sleep disturbances, arthritis, joint replacements, hypertension, scoliosis, multiple sclerosis, osteopenia, osteosclerosis, anxiety, depression, COPD, asthma, cancer, chronic pain, and the list goes on. So that I think that your student who asked the question, how does yoga help with osteoporosis, asthma, arthritis, sciatica? Mm -hmm. That question is the first question. How does yoga contribute to uh, or benefit these disorders? So it's not just the physical. Well, let's start at the physical, I should say. As you say, said very eloquently, yoga addresses more than your body. It's not simply a physical exercise. It is a benefit to 
your mind and it's a benefit to your spirit. It increases your self-awareness. It does connect you more to who you are, why you are, what you are. So physical conditions are benefited by yoga depending on the different poses. There are so many things that go into a practice. Well, first of all, you learn how to breathe correctly. And that sounds elementary, so like no, something you would take not for granted. To me because I know how difficult it is to breathe correctly. And if someone doesn't call your attention to how you're breathing and tell you to breathe, that automatic breathing is untrained and undisciplined. Very true. Very true. So you learn how to breathe. Good breath work relaxes you. It enhances your parasympathetic nervous system, um, putting you in the rest and digest phase versus your fight or flight response in the sympathetic when you're breathing too quickly or when you're caught up in anxiety. Slowing down, breathing carefully, breathing properly, using the proper muscles to breathe. Uh, many Americans breathe with the chest, up in the chest, way high avoiding the abdominal area altogether, but the breath starts at the abdomen. When you're breathing correctly, when, when you're breathing deeply, slowly, consciously, in and out through your nose, it brings you a sense of calm. It brings you a sense of um, peace, stillness. You're from a place where you can respond and not simply quickly react unthinkingly to situations. It allows for so many physiological benefits too. Like I said, the calming effect, um, the rest and digest, the parasympathetic system is toned with that. Um, the breathing capacity improves, your lung function improves. That helps your heart, everything is connected. It lowers your heart rate, it lowers your blood pressure. Um, it lowers so that expands into other things, decreasing your anxiety, decreasing, decreasing your uh, any symptoms of depression. It also is a natural pain reliever breath work. It's a way where you can feel like, again, you're responding and not reacting to a situation. I'll give you a good example of maybe not a medical condition, but scenarios that students have told me about uh, in which they've used the breathing techniques that we've learned in class. Both scenarios were medical tests. Not everybody is comfortable with an MRI or a CT scan. It's an enclosed space. It's scary. You're very nervous. You're very anxious because you're not there to have fun. You're there to figure out if something's right or something's wrong. So there's the anxiety, there's the social, the stress of not being sure of what the uh, outcome is going to be. There's discomfort with the procedure itself. And so people have told me that going into a, an MRI scanner, and um, I had another story regarding waiting for test results in a doctor's office, they used their breathing techniques. And they were able to be calm. And they were able to be still. And the time went by quickly. Um, and they were just able to cope better with, there's acceptance too that comes along with that. There's that calm feeling of accepting whatever is going to happen, whether you deem it something that's very positive in your life or something that's very scary. Things that are out of your, you, you can't control everything. So, but taking charge of your breathing, taking charge of your physical response goes a long way. So that's just one small way that yoga helps medical conditions or coping with medical testing and things. The processes or the physical postures themselves promote muscle strength, endurance. They promote, I promote alignment, making sure your joints are aligned correctly. That helps pre uh, prevent muscle strains, that prevents um, back pain, that prevents pain from arthritis because the alignment is not correct. Um, when your head is not in the proper position, when your shoulders are not stacked over your hips, when your knees are not over your ankles, when your feet are not pointing straight ahead, you're causing one set of muscles to overcompensate while the other set of muscles are becoming weakened. They work together. As I keep saying, everything is connected. And so th those ways also help. 
we work on our balance. We work on making the joints flexible and keeping the range of motion. As we grow older, the range of motion in our joints tends to decrease. And so you want to make sure that you keep moving your shoulder joints healthily, your knees, your hips, your ankles, things like that. So many ways, many, many ways. I, I don't know, and you may, whether or not this has anything to do exactly with yoga, but it does have something to do with breathing. Um, when I was going to have, um, that would have been, would that have been my seventh child? I think so. I want to take the Lamaze method because um, I, I thought that at my advanced age, I had been much younger when I had the other, other six children. And so um, I thought after not having had a child and all that time and, and at an advanced age, I needed to um, do all that I could to make certain that I was able to go through the delivery. So I took the Lamaze uh, method and one of the things that I learned was to breathe with the contractions. Mm -hmm. And the very, um, very logical explanation they gave was that the uterus is a muscle in the same way that the heart is a muscle. And so the, it's not, it should not be painful, you know, to have these contra contractions. So they sold me that. I believed it. And so I was at the hospital in the war, in the delivery uh, room, uh, not in the delivery room, but in a, a place expecting to go to the delivery room. And um, I was reading a book. And when the contraction would come, I would, I would be reminded if I had not, was not breathing properly, to breathe properly and to go with the contraction, not resist it because the resistance made it harder. So to go with the contraction and then, you know, when the contraction eased, then I was reading. So the nurse came in and went out and told other people, other medical staff, she's in there reading a book. <laughs> And then I thought I had a sudden uh, urge to, um, to, uh, to uh, urinate. And I called and said, I need to void. And the nurse came in with the bedpan. And when she pulled back the cover, she said, oh, she's delivering. So she, they <laughs> took the bed and all into the delivery room. And I gave birth to the child. Well, I'm convinced that breathing properly and having the proper perspective goes a long way toward getting through the delivery of a baby because mm -hmm. it happened in, in my case. So I, 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 I wasn't taking yoga at the time, but I was trying to be enlightened about how through the things that I needed to do. The other thing that I'm, uh, I, I know or I think that I remember is that the breathing not only builds strength, but it helps you to do the exercises because it is hard to do yoga poses when you are breathing in property because you have to do the work. But the breath actually does a lot of the work that it takes to go through the various poses. So the importance of the breath can't be overemphasized. Agreed. Yeah. And uh, so asthma, of course, you become anxious when you have an asthma attack. And I've, I, absolutely, you need to be able to relax. And so the arthritis, that's because the joints well, it keeps your joints moving. Right. Again, we're working on joint mobility, um, range of motion and movement. The joint itself can't necessarily be changed by yoga. Mm -hmm. What can help support and what does support a joint 
or the muscles, tendons, and ligaments around the joint. So by keeping the muscles flexible, strong, by keeping those ligaments and tendons supple with movement, nourished by the movement, you help pain in the joint. You, those, that's really the main way to help arthritis with yoga. And also balance, working on balance and flexibility as well. There was something here about joint replacements, yoga and joint replacements. Mm -hmm. I know people have had knee and mm -hmm. hip replacements. How does yoga figure in there? So the same thing, making sure that we're keeping the muscles toned, making sure that we are keeping range of motion, movement is so very important, and adaptations for those um, particular replacements. I've had many students come through pre-post knee surgery, plenty come through pre-post hip replacement. Um, yeah, those are really the main ones that I've had in terms of joint replacements. And so we will do practices that are appropriate on the chair and in the pool. And those two areas, can you receive enough support to gently encourage the strength and the flexibility and adapt the yoga poses that do not make sense for someone who's recovering from surgery. It doesn't make sense for you to be on the floor. It doesn't make sense for you to be going for a headstand. It makes sense for you to be strengthening those muscles again. It makes, in giving yourself, setting yourself up for success. It makes sense for you to be nourishing the joint with movement uh, and again, and keeping the range of motion in these joints. Are there any age limits to practicing yoga is pretty much a, a quick answer. Absolutely not because there are so many forms of yoga, so many forms in our Maybe westernized yoga. Maybe that's something yoga. you should be talking about, the forms. I, we all think of it as somebody standing around mm -hmm. with one <laughs> leg up in the air and not falling down. So the history of yoga is very rich. It comes from a tradition that started thousands and thousands of years ago, five to 10,000 years ago in India. And it really did start from more of a spiritual sense, the scriptures that were written. And over time, there were these different phases in the history where you went from pre-classical to classical to post-classical to modern yoga. And over the time, what has evolved is more than simply a spiritual practice, more than simply a physical practice. It's combining your mind, it's combining your body, it's combining the breath, it's um, spiritual aspects, but not in a religious sense. All of these things come together so that you as a person can increase your self-awareness. You can become a person who approaches life, who expresses life to yourself and to others with joy, with peace, with intent to be the best version of yourself in the world that you possibly can. And so because there was so much evolution and so much change as yoga came into the West, it's been here since uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, Many branches have taken off, and it would really be too long for me to list mm -hmm. the types of yoga yeah, here. I've but heard of and hatha yoga. There's hatha. There's uh, raja yoga. There's kundalini. There's bikram. There are so many types. But what I teach, aqua yoga. I teach hatha yoga in the chair, and I teach um, yoga, aqua yoga, and and some on the mat as well. Hatha yoga on the mat. And the reason why I teach those particular places is again to make it yoga adaptive, to, to use modifications for poses for the appropriate body type. Not everyone is capable of doing the stereotypical headstand or handstand or becoming a pretzel. And that's not necessary. That's not what the yoga is about. The yoga is more about when you go into that pose, What's happening, happening internally? Are you able to sit with the discomfort? Are you able to let go of your ego and not try to strive for something that's going to hurt yourself? Can you be peaceful and present in what you're able to do in that moment, whether it's sitting down in a chair, 
whether it's standing up next to the chair, whether it's using the wall to help you as a prop, can you surrender to what is happening in the moment? You know, the first time I tried yoga years ago, I was so um, disappointed and I think embarrassed mm. that I could not sit with my legs akimbo. I don't know how my joints are attached at the pelvic area, but I could not sit every but one else, it appeared, in that class was able to sit comfortably that way. I could not do it. Now, maybe with, if I had stuck to it, maybe if my ego, if my embarrassment at looking so different from everyone else um, caused me to stop trying. Uh, but the thing is that, that when you say, do what you can do, mm -hmm without being concerned about how, what you appear to be doing to other people because other people are not there to, you're, it's not your show. You know, you're not there to entertain them Absolutely. and they're not, that's not why they came. Mm -hmm. So that's very encouraging. I know that the way you start the class surprised me because it, you said, what is your intention? And the first time you said that, the intention that I came with was to be there by 3 o'clock when the class started. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be in the class on time and to do what you instructed us to do. Um, it had not occurred to me to think about a result or the objective that I wanted to reach by virtue of going through these movements. So talk to me about intention, setting your intention. That's a very good question, and it's an integral part of the yoga practice. Setting your intention, the breath work, the physical postures, and then making your way into a relaxation or, or meditation, if you wish, um, towards the end of the class are all essential. Setting the intention is coming to class with purpose, coming to class with your whole self, ready to be there. And so if there is something, you can use it in so many ways. Is there something you need to let go of? Is there a burden you're carrying? Is there something you're resisting in your life? Is there some change you're resisting? Is there um, energy that you wish to have? Is there pain relief you wish to have? Is there maybe an intention you want to set for someone else? You can do that as well. I wish maybe there's a friend or family member in your life who's undergoing difficult times. You can set an intention. Let me send healing. Let me send light to that person. So you come into class with purpose because it's, a, it's time for yourself. It's time to enhance that connection. And when you start, I have found that setting intentions become so powerful with the yoga practice. The yoga practice transcends the actual hour you're spending. If you really practice the yoga, it's a way of life. So the a very habit of setting intentions in yoga allows you to set intentions in other areas of mm -hmm, your life. Mm -hmm. I have found that to be very true mm -hmm. so that I can approach a difficult decision with intention. I'll be very honest, I was nervous about coming today. I was nervous about being on camera. And so I stopped and I said to myself, what is the source of your nerves? Why is this always your go-to? And it's in a non-judgmental way. That's also something I learned. You let go of judgment in yoga. And you inquire, you, you're still and you inquire. What is the cause of my nerves? And out of that came, through my introspection, the need to be perfect. The need to be, and this is residual leftover. This is something that I have been working with over the course of my life, based on my training too. You had to be perfect all the time, and I internalized that. I internalized that and thought, if I'm not perfect, I'm not good enough. So I have to keep working harder to prove myself. And so, 
when I was thinking about why am I nervous, the need to be perfect, the, the need to be perfectly eloquent and have all of the answers and not to stumble, not to pause. And then I said to myself, well, what if we could reframe the way we're looking at the nerves? What if we can look at that and shed a more positive light on it? Let go of the judgment, I should not feel nervous. It, it could have easily turned into, why am I doing that to myself? I shouldn't be nervous, it's so silly. But I quieted the, the voices and, of the berating and I said to myself, how can, I, how can I reframe this? How can I honor the fact, pay attention to? Yoga does that. With setting the intent, you pay attention. How can I honor? How can I look at the, that and say to myself, how can we make this positive? How can I make this positive? And so what I did was with sitting still, how can I approach this with curiosity? How can I just be present when I sit down in the chair? How can I actually honor myself, who I am, and connect with you, the eye contact, being, listening, waiting, not needing to jump and rush to answer every question. If I have to pause and think about something, pause and think about something. If I'm not sure of the answer, I don't know. To let all of that self, that self berating, all of the, the, the um, the stories that we tell ourselves stories and we think that we're attached to those stories and we can't change those stories, you absolutely can. You absolutely can. Be present, be in the moment. So that's a powerful way that I have found setting an intention in practice, practicing that idea spills into, not only does it keep you in the moment in the class, you can keep referring to it, but it also if you want the gift, you can use it in your life. You know, you have helped me tremendously with that answer because as the host and producer of a television show, I want this to be an interesting show. I want it to be the kind of show that I, will wa I would watch myself if I were out in the viewing audience. Uh, I, I have a mission I want to um, bring things to my viewers that may not necessarily be found in mainstream media. Um, it, it, one catchphrase is, I want to serve the underserved. Mm. Um, but the thing, and I also want to be perfect in the sense that I want to take advantage of the opportunity to get the most benefit out of an interview that I can get and to bring the most insight to the interview that I can bring with the result that sometimes I actually um, have uh, sleep interruptions because I am thinking so hard. And I tell myself during those times that I need to stop doing that because whatever it is I need always comes. You know, I may be sitting in cable casting, entering a show into the schedule when the title of the show will come to me. And I had not uh, been able to think of a title because I could, I always like to frame the show, as you say, reframe. Mm -hmm. I always like to frame a show and I could not, think of how to frame the show because I could not get a handle on what it was that I wanted to come out with the intention. I couldn't set the intention. Uh, aside from giving um, a, a platform or a forum for expression to an issue that I think really needs public uh, scrutiny. so. I, to say all that is that I went through the unnecessary, as you say, the nerves. I went through the unnecessary discomfort of concerning myself about things that really weren't my business because mm. if you select the right guest, you have nothing to do but have a conversation. Because 
you don't have to know everything. And you can stumble and you can make, you know, you can hesitate and you can not know the answer and you can not have the word that it precisely expresses that you, what you want to express mm -hmm. at a given moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you're human, you can be fallible and make errors or whatever. Uh, and the world is not going to end. But, <laughs> uh, so to have you say that, you know, to have, for me to have greater compassion for mm -hmm. my own self mm -hmm. and not to beat myself up mm -hmm. when I don't think I have prepared enough after almost 25 years of do doing this show I am probably as prepared as I'm going to get. <laughs> so so I, I, I think that, you know, I, I couldn't imagine why you should feel any trepidation about it at all because I knew you knew everything that I wanted to ask you. <laughs> and all I wanted to do was get you in here so I could ask you uh, these, these uh, questions. The, one of the questions is how does yoga help balance because you know older people more often than others tend to fall you know sometimes because they're not paying attention to where they're going or sometimes because they lose their balance mm -hmm. so how does yoga help with balance so first of all knowing that as we age it is very normal to lose balance because there are many components that go into providing balance in your body. First of all, your eyesight, very necessary. The inner ear is very important for balance. Uh, your muscles, your joints, your sensory um, system, so touch, pressure under your feet. Um, given all, that, all of those work together, sending information to your brain. Where's my body in space? And then the response is how your brain then s sends messages to your muscles how to um, react. And so with time, all of these systems, just like everything else, because the aging process is normal, everything has wear and tear. The eyesight changes, the inner ear workings change, your muscle endurance, muscle strength naturally diminishes with age. Now we can stop the progression of that and that's where I'll get into the, the, how yoga helps. Um, your nervous system doesn't work as efficiently anymore. Think of a uh, cable wire, electricity, okay? What if that starts to become frayed or worn with time? Well, the transmission, the communication is not going to be as fast or as efficient. So being armed with the knowledge, first of all, that from a point of acceptance, okay, my body is not that of a 20 year old. That in and of itself is magic for yourself because you've acknowledged that I have to show some respect to the body that I have right now. And that means there are certain things that I need to be more aware of. There are gonna be common sense precautions to take, making sure your eyesight is the best it can be, being aware of your surroundings, getting rid of things that might be hazardous, that are unnecessary in your way, clutter, things in your path, cables, um, wearing good shoes, knowing what you're, do if you have, um, issues that affect any of those systems that I just mentioned. So like if you're diabetic, if you're a person who's undergoing treatment like a lot of my cancer um, rehabilitation students are, the, the chemotherapy and the radiation change your body in ways that a lot of people don't know about. And so that affects your balance. Not getting things that we necessarily don't think about. You gotta make sure you get enough sleep. Otherwise, you're not as alert and you're more prone to falling. You have to make sure that you're eating the correct foods, that you're eating a, a whole balanced diet. You're getting the sunlight that you need for strong bones and strong muscles. The exercise is very important. And so we come to yoga. So how does yoga help? Because we work on balance training. We work on specific postures that may only use one leg at a time. And alignment. And alignment, that, and awareness. Where's my, I, my classes, as you know, we go slowly. 
because the purpose of that is to be intentional so that you do when you're out doing something else when you're grocery shopping when you're getting in and out of your car when you're coming to getting out of your bed in the morning even when you're taking stairs where is my body let me pause what's going on can i feel the surface under my feet is there a railing i can hold and hold on to am i using the correct muscles when i need to reach for something on the floor am i thinking about it or am i recruiting big muscles appropriately to squat properly to pick that thing up slowly carefully mindfully so the yoga teaches the mindfulness and the approach to paying attention to how you do activities of daily life that's what we're doing in order to live I just want you to know three minutes is what you have to go to the next thing if you want to go to anything else because you were saying you were going to get into after you got through talking about balance and alignment so is there something you wanted to get in um I do want to talk about the podcast a little bit in the go health ahead. coaching okay so we talked about my evolution a little bit, so it didn't just stop with the yoga uh, training. I also, through a lot of community involvement and allowing things to evolve naturally, we're not in control of anything. That's a big lesson I had to learn. Okay, being the type A go-getter uh, that I have been, you're just not in control of it. And beautiful things can happen if you just trust the process. And so health coaching happened because it's a way where I've been able to teach a class to women in the community, mostly women, a few men do come, about holistic ways to lose weight. It's not a simple formula of just what I eat and how much I work out. It's the quality of the food you eat. It's how you manage stress. It's how you manage life. It's how you manage relationships. It's how you take care of yourself. So all of those things. So that's why I was attracted to becoming a health coach a, in a holistic manner because it's the same idea as the yoga. The yoga is, is a lifestyle. How you treat yourself, how you preserve your body, what you put into your mind, what you decide to. Let me give you a really nice example. There's a meditation exercise that I like to read um, from one of my, it's actually from my teacher, children's teacher training. It's a relaxation exercise. And you picture your five senses as rooms in a house. And those five senses you go through and you cleanse each room very slowly. And it's very, very specific about what you're visualizing as you're in each room. And at the end of the exercise, hopefully your senses are enhanced. I did this with one of my assisted living facilities recently. And a couple of weeks later, one of my ladies told me, thank you for that exercise. I used it recently because I was feeling stressed and anxious. And I said, I'm not going to allow anyone to come into my clean house. Beautiful. I thought it was gorgeous. From there, because of you everything. You got one minute to go from there. OK. So the other thing is um, the most recent development that I'm very excited about that brings all of my work together, who I am, why I am, what I do, is my podcast, Mindful Health for the Wise Woman. I'm, I'm, it's just launched in September. I'm extremely excited and proud of it. And it really puts together a lot of the things that come from yoga, that come from the health coaching, um, I can use what I learned becoming a doctor to help empower women to age healthily and gracefully. Very good. So now I'm going to give my phone number out. If someone wants to get to your podcast, they'll have to ask. And my phone number is 708-257-7325. When you want to have some further information or contact Dr. Kelly, you can call me and I will put her, I will give her your information to her and then you will be in touch with her. But then I, I'm hoping that um, you will look up Yogi MD and find her yourself on the internet. Thank How about you. that? Thank you so You're very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadine It's Nadine been a pleasure. Kelly. Did it's you been have an a honor. good time? I had a great time. Thank you. I enjoyed you. <laughs>
<laughs> Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.